My name is Elizabeth Hoggart, and I am honoured to present my talk on non-operative treatment of carpal instability. When, how, and why? I have no financial disclosures. Before we move in to the when, how, and why of carpal instability, we must ask ourselves another question. What is joint stability? Joint stability was clearly defined by Lynchite and Dobbins in 2002 as dependent on congruent joint surfaces, the static stability from ligaments, and the dynamic neuromuscular controls from muscles acting on the joint. Joint instability may be seen if one or more of these factors fail. The type of instability seen in the carpus is defined in relation to the proximal carpal row. If there is an instability of the entire proximal carpal row in relation to the distal row, it is a CIND, carpal instability non-dissociative, seen, for instance, in the palmar and dorsal mid-carpal instabilities. In these instances, the joint surfaces are usually congruent and the muscle control in place, but the static instability from ligaments have failed. Dissociative carpal instability, or CID, on the other hand, is an instability between the bones of the proximal carpal row seen in scaphalunate or lunotriquetral instabilities. In these instances, the joint surfaces are often incongruent and the static ligament stability has failed. So why should we consider non-operative treatment of carpal instabilities? Well, regardless of whether a CID or a CIND is in place, one constant factor that is always in place is the muscle control of the joint. There is thus always, or just about always, one factor to work with. But how can we use muscle control for non-operative treatment? Neuromuscular control of a joint is dependent on proprioception from joint innovation, adequate muscle function, and the dynamic training for joint control. The effect of muscle control in the carpus has been thoroughly studied by my dear colleagues at Institute Kaplan in Barcelona under the tutelage of Dr. Mark Garcia Elias. What they have found is that muscle action on the wrist not only causes wrist flexion and extension or wrist radial and ulnar deviation, but also an intracarpal rotation. So, for instance, when the APL and the ECRL muscle tendons are loaded, a distal carpal row and mid-carpal joint supination is seen. While if you load the ECU tendon, the distal carpal row and the mid-carpal joint rotate into pronation. So, what is the effect of muscle action on the wrist joint if you have an injury? Well, in the case of scaphalunate or lunotriquetral ligament injuries, it is important to understand the effect of muscle activity on carpal alignment. If a scaphalunate ligament tear is present, activating the ECU muscle will open the scaphalunate gap as it causes an intracarpal pronation. Whereas activation of the ECRL and the APL will close the scaphalunate gap by causing an intracarpal supination. Conversely, in a lunotriquetral tear, ECU activation will close the lunotriquetral gap, whereas an ECRL and an APL action will open it. Well, what about non-dissociative mid-carpal instability? What is the effect of muscle action there? Palmer mid-carpal instability is the most common form of non-traumatic, non-dissociative wrist instability, where clunking of the wrist is noted 
at its, as it's moved from radial to ulnar deviation. It often pertains to hypermobility and is more commonly seen in young women. Using dynamic fluoroscopy, the carpal row can be seen to remain abnormally flexed until it clunks into extension at the end range of motion. In this instability pattern, there are numerous ligaments involved and numerous ligaments that have failed. The volotriquetral hamate, the STT, and the dorsal radiocarpal ligaments. What's interesting to note is that all of these ligaments have been found to be richly innovated with mechanoreceptors, indicating that they have an important proprioceptive function. In a simulated PMCI model in a cadaveric lab, Dr. Alex Yuk at the Institute Kaplan could show that the only muscle able to prevent clunking in a mid-carpal instability was the ECU. In these instances, the ECU causes an intracarpal pronation, but it also causes an extension of the triquetrum. This extension may be further facilitated by FCU action, which will cause a pisiform compression onto the volar surface of the triquetrum. So the intracarpal pronation and triquetrum extension will stabilize the palmar midcarpal instability. So when should conservative treatment be considered? While SIND and midcarpal instabilities are often non-traumatic and conservative management should always be the first line of treatment. The goal is to enhance proprioceptive stimulation of the volar ulnar ligaments and to work to improve wrist stability through ECU isometric exercises with a forearm in neutral position, as well as co-contractions of the ECU and the FCU, often created by doing little finger isometric abductions. In the instance of LT tear with no fixed VC deformity, conservative management can be used. Here also by doing isometric ECU strengthening with a forearm in neutral rotation. And lastly, in scaphalunate ligament tears with pre-dynamic or dynamic instability, no static dissociation or fixed DC deformity, you should promote intercarpal supination through isometric exercises of the APL in neutral forearm rotation and the wrist extensors with a forearm pronated. So in conclusion, for mid-carpal instability, exercise the ECU and perform co-contractions of the ECU and FCU. In LT tears, the ECU should be exercised as well with a forearm in a neutral position. And in scaphalunate ligament tears, APL exercises should be performed in forearm neutral and wrist extensions exercised with a forearm in pronation. Thank you very much.